had another old one, a Gibson again. This guitar has been subcontracted to me from another repair person for a neck reset. So I haven't spoken with the owner, but the instructions are just make it play right. It was described to me as an LG-1, but looking at it, I can unequivocally state that it is not. This is a full-size dreadnought, 16 inches across the lower bout. And looking at the purfling here, I see a single black-white line, uh, and then the binding. So that tells me I'm probably looking at a J45. As for the date, this is before serial numbers were printed on the back of the headstock. There might be a factory order number inside, uh, but there is one distinguishing feature that gives me a date just from looking at it, and it is this. It's a narrow rectangular bridge, and that bridge is paired with this modern post-war block letters design for the logo. This combination only happened for the briefest of times in mid-1947 through 1948. Prior guitars had the sort of swoopy script logo, a little more cartoonish, and guitars after 1948 had the reverse belly bridge. So, kind of definitive. 4748J45 is a pretty desirable guitar. Uh, we might not describe this as a super clean example. Um, there are multiple repaired side cracks, and uh, so much so that it looks like someone has painted the sides black or a dark color to disguise what's going on under there. And there are a bunch of cleats on the inside. On a treble side fracture, it looks like someone used either a black tinted glue or a black epoxy. Um, almost as if someone daubed tar on the inside. Lots of different types of patches. There are linen patches, spruce patches. Um, all of them like seemingly put on there diagonal, which doesn't make sense to me. And some of them seem to be cut from a finished soundboard. That looks like an old guitar top which was cut up for this purpose, with the finish still on. We'll have a look inside. Typical 1940s Gibson bracing. Still on the smaller side, uh, still with scalloped braces. Those would go away mid-50s. You can see there's the small linen patch which crosses over the X-brace uh, intersection there to try and give it some support. Here's the end block. You can see it was cracked right through along with the sides. This can happen if a guitar falls butt first onto its strap button or if it takes a really hard knock against you know, the floor or a table. You can see the cleats too, each with a little hole in it that tells me that they were installed with a tuner clamp and a string that runs right through the side, sometimes known as the Don Teeter clamp. And see what I mean about the diagonal orientation? With a really flat, stiff cleat contacting a concave surface, curved surface like this, uh, there can be issues depending on how much flexibility there is um, you could end up with only two diagonal corners actually contacting the wood. It's like pinpoint contact. It's a real pain working down at the end of the guitar, but it's one of those times when it pays to do what you can to keep them straight. The soundboard seems to be in okay shape, but this finish is just hanging on precariously. It's really flaky and kind of bubbly. Don't want to put any tape on this one. It's also really, really dark having been subjected to years outside a case in a room full of tobacco smoke. There is a pick guard crack, which was glued, and I'm pretty sure that this is not the original pick guard. This looks old. I mean, it looks like a late 50s Martin red-colored tortoise, which I once heard described as looking like fossilized pepperoni, which is kind of an apt description. It may have been cut to the outline of the original shaped guard, but if it was, it's since shrunk. Always a bit of a worry, um, especially if the guard has to be removed to fix that characteristic crack there. When I do it, uh, if the guard's staying off the guitar for more than, say, 20 minutes, I immediately clamp the thing firmly between a couple of pieces of plywood or like melamine particle board, that kind of thing, to try and immobilize it because being stuck to something is really the only thing keeping them that size and shape. And they can shrink noticeably in a day or two. So 
Just something to be mindful of. The back too is in reasonable shape. Much of the binding seems to have lost its layer of lacquer, except for the portion that's right behind the heel. And I really hope not, but someone might have tried to remove this neck once in the past. I don't know. I hope not. Maybe not. So this thing comes to me without strings, and that's a bit of an issue, because though it's obvious that it needs a reset, if I put a ruler on the top of the frets here, project it out to the bridge, it's about an eighth of an inch away from the top surface, which tells me the action is going to be high. Um, but I don't know how the extra force generated by putting strings on will affect the soundboard or the action. So I have to put some strings on there for a while just to see and take some measurements. Otherwise I could grossly underestimate the amount of angle that the neck requires. i got to know what it's going to do. I want to check pretty carefully to see if there are any cracks along the sides of the fingerboard extension. Because those can spell doom. It seems like some forward-thinking repair person might have added the low flat, sometimes called popsicle brace, in front of the neck block. Uh, I don't think these were standard issue at this time. Actually, no. It is factory. I went and checked. That's original. I can see one arm of the X brace has come loose at its end. That has to be glued up. It also looks like the end of the second tone bar, which meets with the arm of the X, is also loose. Got to glue that up too. So we can say it needs a neck reset, but if you got a Gibson that looks like this on the outside, nine times out of ten there are loose braces in there. It just happens to these things. So always more work than anticipated. So even before putting strings on, we'll glue those braces on first because those could affect the way the soundboard reacts, right? With the string tension. Things are mighty loose right now. I'm going to clean up the squeeze out without breaking my finger. String tension reveals some difficult truths. Action is way high, 11 64ths. 964ths, that's like 4.3 millimeters. The back ends of the bridge wings are loose from the top. The saddle is extremely loose in the slot and it's leaning forward a bunch. Actually, the nut that came with this guitar, I'm not sure if this was original equipment or not. Uh, it Actually, it looks like it was cut for a lefty. Um, treble side is kind of okay. This is just sitting on top of the nut more or less and there's a huge amount of relief over the first fret. So I'm going to rudimentarily cut this down to a more appropriate height so I can get a better gauge of what the action would look like with a proper nut. So the action is more like 10 64ths. Still terrible, but it's information I gotta know. Neck relief, virtually none. Maybe a thousandth. Very straight neck. Okay, the amount of threads exposed on this truss rod past the nut here suggests that there's a whole lot of tension on it by someone who is sort of desperately trying to bring down the action using the truss rod, which is not what it's for. Whoa! Okay, so I'm going to take some of that off. Okay, so I dialed in a more normal relief of about five thousandths, which will give us something to work with. Yeah, that should probably be re-glued, huh? This bridge is not in danger of coming off completely. Um, in fact, back here it's perfectly fine, it's solid. Um, because, of course, it's got the screws going through the soundboard. But I want the ends to be stuck down so they don't warp or cause future issues. In this case, I'm pretty safe in just putting some hot hide glue in there and then clamping them right back in position, rather than pulling the entire bridge off, because like, this is solid. Just the ends. They just need a little bit of extra encouragement to stay down. And finally, the thing I want to see when I project the tops of the frets to the front end of the bridge is the gap between the ruler and the soundboard, 
and what happens when I take string tension off. With string tension, the gap was 1 8 of an inch. Without the string tension, it's 3 30 seconds. It's a 30 second of an inch difference, which means this soundboard pulls up a full 30 second of an inch. And if I was to reset the neck so that the straight edge contacted the front edge of the bridge, I would actually be a 30 second of an inch too low. I've got to account for that. So rather than a saddle height of 3 30 seconds of an inch, I'd have something around a 16th, which is kind of measly. So I have to reset the neck so that the straight edge is at least a 30 second of an inch above the top surface of the bridge. The risk is when you're cleaning off the glue you're going to make a clean spot. I'm only half joking about that. People ask why the plastic... I think it's obvious. The finish under here is so alligatory, chippy, that rubbing the um, pallet knife against it makes it want to pop off. So this is my way of endeavoring to keep as much of it on there as possible. I want to go right up to the 14th fret, but try not to go past it and lift the board off the neck proper, because it can be sometimes difficult to get that to glue back down flat. So I can feel that I'm over top of the dovetail there. It's still hot, so I'll pull the fret. Grab my fret pullers. And gently take that out. I can hopefully reuse this fret and put it back in the same place. So I mark the base side before putting that to storage. I'm ready to drill some holes. Got my drill bit, which is a sixteenth of an inch, 1.5 millimeters. This would depend on whichever method that you're using to take the neck off. And I'm going to start in about 3 eighths of an inch from the edge of the board. And just, you know, from experience, I kind of know the shape of a Gibson dovetail. And I'll angle the drill in to sort of follow the line of the dovetail towards the base of the heel. See, I felt it clink into the open space there between the dovetail and the front side of its pocket. Do the same thing on the other side. I've got my holes. I'm just slicing through the build-up and finish in the corner between the heel and the body and also taking note of things like this side crack, which is an extensive one, that runs past the end of the heel block and right to the heel, um, which could cause issues depending on how it was glued and if, for instance, the heel itself is glued to the sides in the process. If I start pulling and wiggling on this thing, it's possible this crack could open up, um, you know, because it's part of the whole system now. Okay, so the body is set up in my neck removal jig. Stuart McDonald makes a perfectly good one. This is a homemade version. Um, I couldn't afford the Stuart McDonald one the first time that I had to take a neck off. So I made my own, and then a few years later I made a subsequent version, which corrected some of the things I got wrong the first time. It might be cheaper just to buy the one from Stumac. And then, of course, I've got my foam cutting knives, which are actually wires, a nichrome wire. Um, I buy these from hotwirefoamfactory.com. Uh, not a sponsor, although they did actually send me a couple because apparently a lot of people have seen my videos and I started using these and they wanted to send me a thank you. So they're maybe a kind of a partial sponsor. Eek. Anyway, turn these guys on, and I'm going to let it sit for about 10 minutes, and that should be enough to get things moving in there. Things weren't moving very fast, so I started to add a little bit of water on the sides of the heel and into the dovetail pocket to generate some steam, hoping this would sink in there and lubricate things. I swear, if I have another top-over dovetail, I'm going to hop in my time machine 
go back to whenever and smack every single Gibson production manager I can find. Well, it let go. Okay, this is interesting to me. Because this took quite a lot of effort to get off. But once I get in here, the cheeks of the dovetail are essentially clean of glue. They look dry. It looks like there was never any glue on them, actually. There's a little bit on the front surface here, and a corresponding blob or two down in the bottom. There are some wet marks, but I'm kind of thinking those are the water that I put into the joint to try and loosen it up. I think it's possible that this thing was held together without glue. It was locked really securely, but it was a mechanical fit between the two parts of the joint rather than the adhesive holding things together. It's kind of interesting. There's a hairline crack through the heel which had previously been glued and which opened up upon heating, which I've re-glued. I'm just trimming a little bit of the excess material which is eventually going to get sanded away with a chisel. It'll save me some time. Uh, I don't want this undercut to be extreme and in fact I'll just do a little bit and then come back later on in the sanding process and deepen it if necessary. It just sort of helps the sandpaper get a start. Uh, you can also see the end of the Gibson truss rod here and you might note how low it is. The, uh, you know, the positioning here kind of surprises some people. This rod bends down with the curve of the heel. Yeah, the, the dovetail mortise or the pocket, like it's dry. Really dry. Ordinarily the chisel makes a characteristic kind of crinkly sound. That sounds like raw wood. You'll have to bear with the sound of my dehumidifier and my fan. It's a little bit humid hereabouts. So I've explained this many times. I'm pulling sandpaper through the joint from the area where the fingerboard contacts the front surface of the top to the back of the heel. And by pulling this through the joint it's mating the two surfaces, making them sort of congruent, but they're also it's tipping the heel back because more material is being removed off the end of the heel. It's still being sanded all the way along where this portion up here is not sanded at all at this point. So this is what's tipping the neck. Uh, this is also loosening the dovetail in its socket. And I continue this checking occasionally to make sure that I'm not overshooting the mark and that also the neck is staying straight with the body. I'm not sanding in gross deformities or something. And every so often I have to sand the portion of the heel which is not being contacted by sandpaper during this process. There's a little section in the middle here which isn't being hit by the sandpaper. It's the width of the end of the dovetail or thereabouts. So I'll come back and get rid of that. Otherwise it starts to feel like you're making absolutely no progress because you aren't really. This little segment will hold the heel above the body and the sandpaper can't do its work. So I'll go back and do this, do about five or six strokes, and then continue. I glued shims to both sides of the dovetail, and I'm progressively sanding and scraping them down. Okay, with shims in place, I can slide the neck into the pocket, and um, there is still a gap of about a quarter of an inch between the fingerboard and the soundboard. And uh, I can rock this back and forth. It won't go in all the way but I can rock it up and I can tell that the end of the dovetail is loose. So I'm going to work on portions of the shims that are higher up and then dial that down. Um, ideally I want the snuggest part of the dovetail to be the end of the tail 
because that's the portion that could possibly pull away in future. Um, that's a dangerous part. That's where all the force is centered. So ideally you want it to fit perfectly all the way along the joint, but I absolutely make sure that it's not loose at the end. Okay, so I've thinned some more off the top of the shims. Uh, still have a ways to go. And we're getting tighter. There's less wiggle. But there's still some, so I know that I still have to work on the upper portion of the dovetail. Okay, another round, and the heel is no longer loose. I can't rock it. No, I can just a tiny little bit. It moves about a sixty-fourth of an inch. Which means I still have to concentrate on the top, but by and large, this is fitting at the very base, so I can now basically remove an equal amount of material all the way along the uh, dovetail on both sides and it's going to slip in and because of the way the dovetail functions it's going to be tight all the way in and I still got this mm, 3 sixteenths of an inch to go so this is a slow kind of process I gotta do it and test it and do it and test it and uh, eventually sneak up to the point where it bottoms out and it's snug all the way along its length I want to check pretty frequently with a string to check the line of the strings versus the center line of the neck and make sure that I'm not tilting it one direction or the other and it seems good okay that's locked in place it's not going anywhere um, it is very solid like this thing isn't coming out I have to push with some concerted effort to get it to come. Uh, so I feel confident in that. It's going to lock up securely with the glue. I once saw a factory tour video from some manufacturer somewhere who will remain nameless and I saw people putting together guitars where they would slide the neck joint into place and it would be like this. And they'd slather it with a whole bunch of white glue and sort of rely on that to hold things together because the fit was not great and I was thinking to myself boy those things must have really self-destructed pretty quickly because I mean you want it to be mechanically locked like this guitar was you know it survived 70 years with without any glue you know it was just the mechanical locking of the dovetail so I feel good about that now I'm gonna work on the shim I've got some feeler gauges stacked up here to see what it'll take to keep this fairly straight. A little bit of fall away is okay, of course. So I'll plane the wedge to the appropriate thickness and then taper it. And I'll glue it in place on the underside of the fingerboard extension. When that's dry, I can plane and sand it to appropriate shape. I'll color the shim to disguise it. As I'm doing this, just checking to make sure I've got the clearance I want, which is just a little over a 32nd of an inch over the top of the bridge. Um, it's around 4.15 in the morning. I don't know what it is, but ever since I was a little kid, when the hot weather rolls around, if it gets you know really humid and stuff, my body just, for whatever reason, wants to go full-on nocturnal. I like being up late. It's not all that convenient, because I usually have to get up just after 7 o'clock, but make it work. I've got a padded call here, C-A-U-L, clamping call. It's cut to fit over top of the transverse brace here, uh, so I have something to clamp to on the end of the fingerboard that isn't that brace, because that is pretty annoying. You know, when you look inside the guitar and you see great big clamp marks on that piece of spruce there, it just eh, it rubs me the wrong way. So, this gives me something to clamp to. All clamped up. I made a snug new saddle. This is going to get glued in anyway, but it should be tight. New nut time as well. A little bit of fret dressing is necessary in the upper positions here. Then of course the recrowning and polishing. Polishing, polishing. And finally, I think we're all ready to go here. We've got good action height, decent saddle exposure. 
there's enough fret left to play. Um, they're pretty low, but they'll function. And yeah, this thing has, you know, sort of been through the ringer in terms of guitar repair. Like, virtually the entire body has cracked in half at various points. But uh, it still has that 1940s Gibson sound. <laughs> 